Welcome to an exceptional edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. I have the super brilliant Dr. Meet Gandhi, Ward Professor, Chief Economist at Microsoft Azure Global, got his PhD from Chicago. I know Amit personally, and I have to say, he's one of the smarter minds I've come across from University of Pennsylvania, a place I've been to many times, and I really have enjoyed getting to know Dr. Gandhi. And he's come on today to talk about this class that he's teaching now at Wharton, which is really reinterpreting classical market design. And Dr. Gandhi, thank you so much for coming on. And I'm so excited to learn about this. Yeah, thank you, Alex, for having me back on the show. And I'm a huge fan of, of, of the show in general. So, so thank you very much. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. So are we going to have real world interpretations of how to use economics with this class? Absolutely. Yeah. And so, so, so um, really the course is trying to achieve a few different ends, one of which being how do you actually go off and use economics in the real world? And I think this has mm -hmm. been sort of the gorilla in the room for economics education since Alfred Marshall, since he wrote down the supply and demand curve um, on his blackboard in, 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 at the University of Cambridge at some point in the 19th century, because it's beautiful in concept and it's beautiful in theory and, and it's aesthetically pleasing. And if you go off into the business world, you will invariably hear the words um, supply and demand you will invariably hear the words economic fundamentals. But how do you translate the, the paper conception and the language and the sort, of, the sort of elegance into functional real world stuff? And, and, and that's been a historic challenge for the field. Um, and that's why I think when people conceive of economists, they think about sort of a talking head on TV, someone kind of really kind of explaining the world and, and, and the role of a chief economist is, is traditionally one of, of, a, of, of a big mind sitting at the top of the company, um, advising, really kind of in, a, in an advisory capacity. And I think what we've seen now with the emergence of data um, and cloud is an opportunity to take this really elegant thinking and this sort of these beautiful ideas and really make them functional, make them practical, make them useful um, in, in many walks of, um, of, uh, of life and, and, and society and business and, and government. Um, but it's new, it's, it's a very new area, not just for technology and software and data, but for economics itself. And so the course is really an attempt to start to frame these issues, um, both for economists and, and, and I think for students. And, and I'm hoping it's gonna be a, a fun, enjoyable experience. Are you taking your experience for Microsoft and applying that for the class as well? Yeah, no, very much. And so it's actually kind of um, a little funny because I was um, just teaching in my graduate course, um, very famous paper by Leo Bremen, um, written in 2001. He's the founder of, um, of Random Forest, one of the, the very kind of popular machine learning methods. And he literally wrote a paper 20 years ago called the two cultures. And, and he, he referenced it as sort of um, data modeling culture versus algorithmic modeling culture. And one thing interesting about Leo Bremen is that he left academics, went off and became a consultant for 10, 15 odd years, and then kind of came back and just couldn't recognize his field anymore. Um, and, 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 and he wrote this kind of this paper really kind of imploring his, his, his colleagues to sort of take this algorithmic practical view of, of their tooling more seriously, more seriously. Now that was 20 years ago. Look where we've come now. Um, and and I, I've talked with Leo. Leo's a brilliant guy. Yeah. And I think, you know, your point is really, really apt, especially for today. And the kind of the genesis for me was like long-term capital management. One time the largest quant fund in the world had no economic insight to their model. Their model was purely based on the data. And, and the idea to me that you can't have economic insight, every investment needs economic insight today. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, 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 one of the, it's, it's, it's the greatest low hanging fruit in our economy, right? Like we, we are, we are we're, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're, it's, it's all around us, but it's everywhere and it's nowhere at the same time. And that's really the key then is to sort of like, how do you touch the data and start to talk in these, in these terms? Now, you can ask me about the experience at Microsoft, one thing I learned, and I think this is the, the biggest paradigm shift for me really since I was in grad school, um, was starting to think about 
our creations, because we like to use the word model. You'll hear the word model a lot. I wrote down a model and I have this model and, and, and we kind of fall in love with our models. Uh, and the models are beautiful um, and they're very explanatory and, and they're causal and, and, and they have a lot of great language. But when you want to make it functional and practical, there's a new hat you have to wear. And that's a very new hat, which is really think about your model, both as a science creation, but also a product. It's a product that has a user. Right? And that user will typically be a human being. <laughs> a human being is, let's, let's give these things names. So you have a product with a user and it's a human. And it, it dramatically changes your attitude and approach to even building models in the first place. Because now we're trying to make models to, to be used, to be consumed, to be, to, be, to be factored into actual, the keyword, decisions. Um, and, and so you kind of, start with the decision and kind of work backwards into the model. And then you actually kind of work backwards even into the data because often when you have to take a model into practice, you never have the data you want. There's this myth that we have big data. And I think it's great, like there is big data, but you never have the data you want when you want it, where you want it to build what you need. And very true, very true. you have to often bootstrap modeling without data. And, and the way to kind of get into that mindset is, is really like we as economists and, and, and model builders can learn a lot from product designers. And that's actually the other key word in the, in the title of the um, course, market design. There's, it's market, that's the economics, but there's a design element to this, which can really follow a great tradition in design, both artistic design, digital design, product design, where we design for humans, it's kind of human-centered design. And I think economics, it's, it's kind of, you may have heard this term, the dismal science. Uh, it, it's sometimes afraid to talk about actual people, um, but fundamentally, if we want to put it in the hands of people, we're gonna have to deal with people. And that opens up, you know, Alex, a lot of other cans of worms involving, well, how is it that people actually make their everyday economic decisions? And does that, equate to the kinds of assumptions we often put in economic models. And that's really where you get into a pretty interesting, uh, not just kind of practical conversation, but very philosophical conversation about if we're writing down models where people are rational, but I have a human user and they can't use data in the way that the economics wants them to use data, what does that mean and what is that really saying? So it's a, it's a really interesting uh, hotbed of issues. No, definitely, indeed. You know, we're entering a new world of economics, one where the traditional economist is very much becoming obsolete. And I kind of saw this in 2011 when we had the first S&P debt downgrade of the U.S. government caused a ridiculous reaction, maybe a 40% drop in the markets over the next few weeks. And four out of five economists felt the U.S. would fall into recession. But the data just wasn't there. And it was this very emotional you know, and I remember uh, one of our clients at the time was the owner of the Red Sox and he calls me up and he goes, Alex, I got, I got all these economists telling me I got to go cash. And I said, you know, listen, uh, you know, what we've built at Rebellion is a, you know, a kind of a Bayesian network that's monitoring the global economy. And, you know, we see strength, uh, though we see, you know, ridiculous price drops, we see strong, uh, you know, momentum in the U.S. economy, which is also, by the way, what got us early on the Greek debt crisis in 09. That was that was actually shooting fish in a, a barrel. The, the fact that people were upgrading Greece when they were the only, you know, negative retail sales, you know, negative industrial output in, in all of Europe is just, it's amazing. Uh, you know, e economics is not going to be a field driven by emotion uh, going forward. It's going to be very much a quantitative field. That's why I saw your class and I thought to myself, I was like, this is fantastic. I'm so glad Dr. Gandhi's teaching this. This is so necessary, absolutely necessary. Yeah, and you know, you're, you know, you're working in a really important and interesting industry with, with finance, because if you think about some, one of the, in terms of if you look at the industry landscape, who is typically the first adopter of uh, the, the, the latest and greatest in economics has always really been finance, because you know, once you go from a paper that can make money, who's gonna use it? You know, it's efficient markets, like it has to get sort of employed somewhere. And I think, what you're sort of saying is, is exactly right, that kind of even the simplest, I mean, I think we can still go back to papers from the 80s and just pluck them up, stick them in software, 
put them in incubation network, as you say, and you're going to see a signal. You're going to see something. That oh, nobody, very much so. Yes. Nobody, no, nobody else can see. And I think the challenge, Alex, is what finance has done. How do we get that employed across industries more holistically? Mm. Um, and now, obviously, not everything is finance, and the data can be trickier. But I think that willingness to kind of be pioneering, that willingness to be a little wild west. I, I mean, I think really, really, there's a lot to be said about what finance uh, has showcased. Now, of course, it, as you pointed out, that leads to some dangers <laughs> as well, because you, you can suddenly now kind of enter periods of volatility. Um, and I've seen this firsthand in, in, in corporate decision making that there's a fear of just kind of letting the, the, the data kind of just, just, just talk. And this is once again, where modeling languages are crucial. I think there's also a mindset that corporate America does not trust economists. It's, it's one that's happened over many, many, many decades. Exactly. They want them, they'll pay for them, but they're scared to trust them. I mean, in my own studies as a student, I was not turned on by economics. I actually wanted to be a, a professor of political philosophy. I loved Clausewitz, but I don't have any skills for verbal and my only abilities were with numerics. So I started playing around with economics and that's how I ended up in this field because I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, teach closets. I wasn't smart enough. So, you know, it, it's, it's really amazing to see that with the kind of data explosion, economics is ha having a whole new heyday in my opinion, and yeah. it will become a much more valuable central part of decision-making both in academic and in the corporate world. That, you know, that is the hope and it's really incumbent upon I mean, it's not even though it's going to, it's happening. It's happening now. Like we, we, we don't even have to wait for it. I think what is not fully understood is what is it, what is exactly happening and starting to formalize that and actually teach it and make it part of both the earliest and you know, part of your undergraduate experience with economics all the way into the MBA executive ranks. Um, because yeah. I, as I like to say, we're all economists, which is we're all making economic decisions. We're making, we're all making economic decisions every day. And so we're all, economists at some level. Now the question is, to what extent do we want to actually use formal economics in thinking through those decisions? Um, and I think it wouldn't be crazy to say, you probably should use a little bit. Um, and then the question is, how do you do that? Economics very much to me is an art, uh, an art that can be explored to, to huge lengths, as opposed to accounting. Accounting for me is you know, very much building blocks. So how much can you really do? You can have the building blocks, you can analyze the building blocks, you can look at new ways to do building blocks. But economics is really the understanding of the movement of our society and how human beings interact with each other and at what prices we'll exchange goods at and how much we're going to want those goods. So it, it's, it's, it's almost with this kind of data explosion that we're in, economics is really just becoming much more important than it ever was before. Yeah, I actually bring up something really interesting there about accounting because I think one of the hardest things about trying to use economics in a, in a real world scenario is that all the variables that we imagine in the models, let me just even give them names, marginal cost, <laughs> uh, economic profit, you know, these terms we use, when you go off into a company and you look at their books, you don't see any of those variables, right? I don't see marginal cost. I, of course I see, not. I see accounting costs. And so there is this, what you're raising is, is also part of the data challenge is how do you map from observables, which are, which are really sort of what's in the records, uh, which are transactional, it's sort of is, accounting is, is, is the transactional language um, into the economic language. And I will sort of just in, in defense of the science a little bit is to say that's where the, the modeling concepts are critical because there's, it's, it's, not unambiguous, it's, it's not unambiguous how to measure um, profit, <laughs> how to measure cost, how to measure value, how to me measure customer success. And then I can layer on as many, you know, corporate buzzwords uh, as I like. How do you map those in, in, into measurables? And the last thing I'll just say about the kind of the design thinking approach, and I think what's really powerful and, and what a lot of academics naturally do when they write papers and do science is the iterative method, which is, you know, you don't know. So write down a model and, and, and take a shot, right? And start to use it. And then you'll realize this measure is not what I want. I need to iterate, I need to tweak. And then really, I think what's really hard is how do you get that iterative method to start to kind of take over your thinking? And that's really what I'm kind of going back to the class. What I'm hoping to do with the students is to actually immerse them in an economic decision 
and carry out the building of a product around that decision over the course of the semester. So that, I'm, I'm really excited to see kind of where that goes. That's very, very cool. You know, that's, that's why students work hard to get into a school like Wharton to have opportunities to take classes like yours that are just not available at most the average to, you know, the 99.9% .9 of schools that are not Wharton. I think this will be part of the standard part of economics education. I wonder if Dr. Gandhi's students was a rebellion intern last summer and was a big fan of yours. Actually, I think I had two of your students uh, as interns. And rebellion is about 140 students now. So it's hard to keep track of them all, but uh, you've gotten rave reviews from the students that I've had at Rebellion. So that was great to hear. I really, I really enjoyed hearing that. But uh, this is a very, very fascinating class. And I really appreciate you coming on. You mentioned causality earlier. Um, do you know Professor Judea Pearl of UCLA? Yeah, I mean, I, not personally, I think we have exchanged um thoughts on twitter but uh big i've been harassing judea to come on the show and yeah. he's being all shy which is annoying and i'm gonna send him this show too and say i keep pushing well, I would, you but I, I would love to i would love to to, to chat with Judea if, if i can work oh, he's judea is the best but yeah. his work in the 90s actually inspired me to get into bayesian networking his work on probabilistic uh inference but now judea believes that the future is all going to be causal inference. And yep. Causality, he's totally changed his tune. He's all about causality now. He thinks that's going to be the next wave of economic and financial understanding. So, yeah, it's, very it's interesting exciting, stuff. It, it's an exciting time, very exciting time yeah. for everyone. And now the big question is, uh, and we'll have to save this for another show perhaps, Alex, is what is causality? And, and that is... Uh, well, I would love to do a show with you, Dr. Gandhi, on causality. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. That would that, be a, a, a great uh, show. I've been putting out more papers, and I've been doing all my best to learn about causality, mostly because Professor Pearl told me to go learn about it. So, you know. He's, 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 a, he's a real trailblazer. And, of course, won the Turing Award. So he's been Oh, yes. Yeah, he won the Turing Award. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, so yeah. No, I, uh, no, he changed my life very much so. And I told him that. I said, you know, you changed my life. I would never have done rebellion without you. And uh, I, I couldn't be more thankful. I, uh, like I said, I, I wanted to be a political, my father was a speechwriter for Vice President Mondale. And so I thought I wanted to be like a, you know, Bates or Bowden political science professor in the middle of Maine. That seemed like my dream. <laughs> well, you know, it's not too late. It's not too late. Uh, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of uh, stuck in New York City, and unless the World okay. Trade Center can grow uh, legs. But uh, this was a fantastic uh, conversation. Yeah, thank, really you, but thank you for, Alex, for having me. And, and let's uh, do another show on causality. And, uh, you know, that, that'd be a lot of fun. And I hope you come on many more times. You're you know, awesome. uh, just a wealth of knowledge. And awesome. uh, stay safe during these crazy times. And uh, enjoy those adorable children of yours. Absolutely. Thank you. Same to you. Thanks. Right.